um, welcome everyone. My name is Alessia and I'm joined by my colleague Valina. Yes. And uh, we come from the Adler Community Health Services team. So we're your wellness team at um, PHC. Mm -hmm. And we've been presenting a series of uh, webinars and we're on our last one for the month. Um, this one's on managing conflict. Okay. So um, before we start, we're just sharing a link to the survey for uh, after the presentation in case anyone has to leave early. If you have a moment, we um, would be really grateful if you could fill it out, uh, just providing some feedback on how we did today. And um, if you have any suggestions or thoughts on um, further topics that we could uh, present to you. Yeah, and that's the QR code if you know the link is too difficult. <laughs> okay, so um, <clears throat> I'm just gonna go through the overview of what today is gonna look like, things that we're gonna be talking about. So we're gonna first start off with the definition of conflict, what conflict is, um, types of conflict that can happen. And then Alessia and I will talk about the styles of um, handling conflict or the common styles of handling conflict, um, consequences of unmanaged conflict or unresolved conflict, um, and barriers that we might have to resolving conflict and techniques to resolving conflict. I, I do recognize that I've said conflict like many times. Um, so Alessia is going to start us off here today. So we have a little exercise for you. So if you have a pen or paper or want to pull out the notes app on your phone, um, we'd like you to think about a few words that best describe your feelings about conflict. So we'll give you about a minute to do so and then we'll regroup. I'll do that. Okay, so now we'll invite you to take a moment to just um, reflect on some of the words that uh, came up for you mm -hmm. and um, whether they were mostly positive, negative, um, and kind of what feelings come up as you see these, these words. Um, if we can go to the next slide. So they might be one of these words here. Um, so a lot of them might look like stressful or um, wanting to avoid, dreading, feeling frustrated, uh, apprehensive. And some of them might um, be a little bit more on the positive end, like useful to achieve change, uh, providing opportunity and challenge. Um, so this exercise was actually done uh, during a study where they provided a um, conflict resolution uh, workshop for participants. And they asked them before the workshop to um, note down what words came to mind. And then after the workshop, I think it was a three-part workshop. And what ended up happening was with more skills, they ended up coming up with more positive type words. So finding the usefulness in conflict. And that's what we're hoping to bring to you today. Okay. Um, <clears throat> so, great. Okay, perfect. So um, I'm gonna start us off with the definition of conflict and when it happens and like what it's about. So what is conflict? Um, and we've all been in conflict, so I know that this like slide might be like, okay, I know what that means totally, but we're going to cover it anyway. Um, conflict occurs when our existing like knowledge or interpretation or point of view is different than someone else's, right? So when conflict happens, two things can happen. The first is conflict can raise doubts about the validity of our point of view. So um, the authors, Butera, Samit, and Darnin, they talked about this. So when we um, experience a point of view or a perspective that's different from ours, what can sometimes happen is 
we get decentered or pulled away from our own beliefs because <clears throat> what happens is when we receive conflicting information, our brain or us, what we're trying to do is we're trying to integrate this on incoming information. So during that period, we experience kind of a cognitive dissonance or just like a, like a decentering from like our um, current perspective. And so, um, well, that can go two ways, right? Either we act in ways that benefit and benefit us in the future, or we are more focused on the short term of like, no, this is too much for me. This decentering is really uncomfortable. Another thing that happens with conflict is um, it can raise doubt on our competence, right? And this happens to, I think, so many of us. When our competence is questions, I think our first instinct to do is to be like, no, I am competent. I'm going to disagree. I'm going to stick with my, I'm going to stick with my guns. I don't know, stick with my point of view. And so these are the two things that can happen in conflict. And we'll kind of elaborate on this um, as we keep going through the webinar. And now Alessia is going to talk about, like, you know, she's going to keep it a little bit light and talk about the benefits of conflict if managed effectively. Yes, if managed effectively is the key point. Yes. Um, so first, um, conflict can really help us to identify problems early, um, especially in the workplace. Um, there can be these kind of trivial disagreements or seemingly trivial disagreements, but they really stem for, from underlying unaddressed issues that if they're not addressed, they can really fester and then cause kind of an explosion down the road. And so conflict can kind of shine a light on processes or practices that need to be improved or replaced. Um, it can help us uh, hone in our problem solving and communication skills. And so um, seeing other perspectives can be difficult. And when people disagree with us, that can be really challenging. Um, but if learning, we learn to manage it effectively, what can happen is that we can start to see other perspectives and um, validating another person's perspective and being validated can really end up increasing our communication skills and solving problems. This can lead to healthier relationships, um, really understanding another person a little bit better, understanding ourselves better, uh, improving productivity. So if there's these unresolved conflicts underneath uh, kind of our normal interactions, what can happen is that can take away from productivity. If we can um, figure out how to resolve these problems in a healthy way, then that goes away and it increases productivity. And then lastly, personal growth and insight. So conflict really shines a light on what is triggering for us and what um, kind of gets us emotional and heightens us. And so in the moment, we might not always be our best selves because conflict can really trigger some um, defensiveness in us. But when we can take a step, step back and practice some self-awareness, it can really show us where we need to grow and, and what's difficult for us and, and where we can give ourselves a little bit more love and nurturing. So <clears throat> I'm going to go back into um, types of conflict and, and where they can show up. So there are many frameworks for conflict or theories, but um, I thought sociocognitive conflict or this framework would be most relevant um, because I think it fits really well into the workplace setting when we uh, likely or like most of the time experience this sort of conflict. So <clears throat> sociocognitive conflict has two components to it, cognitive and the social aspect. Sorry, <clears throat> just clearing my throat. Um, in this type of conflict, the cognitive aspect is when um, we're focused on a task, especially at a workplace, right? That could be patient care, that could be a project, that could be ways procedures should be done at a certain time. And then there's a social aspect, right? That's focused on social comparison. Does my colleague think I'm, I'm an idiot, right? Do they think I'm competent? Do they think I'm able to treat people? Do they think I'm able to work on my own? And so kind of talked about this earlier, when we um, are faced with an opposing point of view and we're able to successfully integrate it, what ends up happening for us is that the ideas that we have or the knowledge that we have becomes more complex and adaptive than our own single individual position. Not to say that our original ideas aren't good enough, but 
if conflict is managed successfully, we our knowledge base becomes richer, right? So uh, like Alessia was kind of um, talking about this, the benefits of conflict, this is one of it, successful integration of opposing points of view just makes us better. Um, and so conflict resolution can be quite, it's a quite useful tool because it helps us shape our cognition and guide our behavior into more useful or beneficial ways of being, right? Than our current states of mind because, because the successful integration makes us better. And so with this socio-cognitive conflict, there's two types of conflict. One of it is epistemic conflict and one is relational conflict. So in terms of epistemic conflict, right? Um, the slide here says like meaning of conflict is attributed to the task at hand. So what that means is the, the focus or the core of the conflict is really about the task, right? Oh, this should be done that way. That's not how you do this. We need to get this done in two days. What are we gonna do, right? The goal really is to learn and master the task at hand. And so in situations like this, um, we've all been in situations like this, right? Where like the project is more important than like maybe social aspects of it. You're like, there's a deadline, this, this needs to get done. And so on, on the flip side of that is relational conflict where the meaning or the core of the conflict really is attributed to the person rather than the task or idea. And so with this, what can likely happen is we're thinking, oh, um, they're disagreeing with me. So they must think I'm an idiot or maybe they don't think I'm smart enough. That's why they're disagreeing with me. Or maybe we're like, oh, they're disagreeing with me, so they're stupid, or maybe they're not good enough, or they're not smart enough. So really, we're kind of like, um, like, kind of like marrying or like kind of like lumping together the person and their opinions and beliefs. So the goal here or the focus is to demonstrate competence. The task at hand is not really the focus anymore. We want to show people that we're competent because that's important to us, right? To kind of belong and show people like we're able and we fit in here. So we're going to dive into um, like relational conflict in the next slide a little bit. And in relational, when we um, engage in relational type conflict, again, we want to defend our competence, right? And we as humans may adopt both these types of conflict. Like we take part in these in different situations. Like no one's just one way of um, dealing with conflict. We're different, right? We, we evolve or like we're dynamic in different situations, sorry, is what I want to say. So um, when we're regulating conflict in a relational way, there's two things we might do. So one of it is we stick to our own opinions. We're like, no, like I'm right. Or we might comply with the other person because we're like, oh, maybe they're right and I'm wrong. Okay, so then let's look at competitive relational conflict and protective relational conflict. When we have relational conflict or any kind of conflict, really, it causes stress in us. Like maybe some people feel more stressed than others, but there is a level of stress that develops. And when this stress or tension comes up for us, most of the time we're very focused on reducing the tension than really solving the problem. Okay, so in competitive relational conflict, what tends to happen is that, for example, we're in a situation uh, where you know you're competent in this area. Like maybe you've done extensive research or maybe you're an expert in this area and someone's questioning your competence or your knowledge base. And so you feel like, no, actually I'm able to deal with the stressor. I am able to stand my ground. I'm able to speak my thoughts. So when that happens for us, we're likely to see the situation as more of a challenge, right? So when we see the situation as a challenge, we might adopt strategies that are more confrontational, that are argumentative, that is like maybe clarifying your needs, being assertive. And so <clears throat> sometimes in competitive relational conflict, uh, when we see things as a challenge, part of what happens is in our minds, what, we, what happens is that we're like, oh, there has to be a clear winner or loser. Um, one person has to be right, one person has to be wrong, right? And in this situation, especially in workplaces, I think um, being right can afford status, right? It can get praise, um, people, especially if you're a manager, people want you to be right so that they feel comfortable trusting you on a day-to-day -day basis. So the focus here is outperforming others and establishing superiority because sometimes that can be really important in the line of work or your position that you're in. Now on the flip side of it, like uh, another way to reduce stress is to comply. 
And so in certain situations, we might be faced with information, knowledge, or someone's questioning us. And we feel like, oh, actually, like, I don't feel comfortable right now. And it could be several factors. Maybe you don't know the topic very well. Maybe you've had a long week and you're just like overwhelmed and can't get into a confrontation right now. Or maybe the situation is actually very dangerous for you to get into a confrontation. So what happens then is we view the situation as a threat. And so when we see the situation as a threat, we want to take more like protective ways of coping. That's like avoidance or compliance, anything to kind of get this person off our backs so that we don't feel that stress or feeling inferior or less than because that's what conflict, that's what conflict resolution does. We're trying to reduce tension a lot of the time. So um, a lot of the times we're, we're trying to not up like being outperformed by others. So we don't want to let people know we're being outperformed by them. And we want to avoid inferiority. And so these are the two types of conflict that can show up. And so now Alessia is going to talk about causes of workplace violence. Yes. So this really goes in line with Bill, with what with with what Bill is saying. <laughs> yeah. um, and in healthcare, conflicts can arise with different people. So patients, families, colleagues, um, other healthcare professionals, administrators, etc. And so there are five sources of conflict, typically. One being values and beliefs. So different world worldviews, different ideologies, cultural differences, essentially different criteria for evaluating ideas. Interpersonal relationships, so there being miscommunications, strong emotions, stereotyping, um, potentially repetitive negative behaviors or destructive behaviors, either from one person or from both. Organizational um, structures and roles. So there being power differences or unequal control of resources when the lines of authority are really unclear. Um, if there's time constraints that can cause some pressure and if someone's not pulling their weight, for example, then that can lead to even more, even more pressure and a time constraint um, and environmental constraints, not having the resources. So interests, procedural, psychological or substantive and information. So having lack of data, misinformation, differing interpretations of data or different opinions on relevance of data. Sometimes, too, in a conflict, more than one of these things can be occurring. So we'll go into resolving conflict now. Okay. All right, I'm clicking it. <laughs> it's not working. Okay. <laughs> yeah, it's working. There we now. go. <laughs> okay. So um, I think Bill touched on this a little bit. There's different styles of handling conflicts. And these different styles can stem from the situation. It can be more trait based. So um, you might find yourself um, kind of using one of the strategies a little bit more than another um, based on how you were raised or what's normal in your culture um, or maybe um, the power differentials in your role at work. Mm -hmm. um, and I found this infographic interesting because it shows um, the different levels of assertiveness and also cooperativeness based on each um, different type of handle, style of handling conflict. So, for example, uh, avoiding would be unassertive and uncooperative, whereas um, collaborating would be the most assertive and the most cooperative. Um, collaborating is kind of the, the way, the optimal way that we would want to go, but sometimes it's not possible. So we'll go into each individual one, starting with avoidance. So um, avoidance would happen when, or it would be useful if the issue is not as important as maybe something else that's going on in your day-to-day -day life. And when delaying con confronting this issue is of no consequence. So when you need to buy some time, um, and maybe you feel really heightened and really emotional. So dealing with this, the issue in that moment might not be possible um, or might not be the best idea. Um, and if you have little or no power, so if you're not able to make changes, then you might avoid the issue because that would serve you best in that moment. Um, there are some downsides. So you might not resolve the issue and the issue might fester. 
and others might become frustrated or confused. Um, maybe if you're displaying some really strong emotions about a situation and they don't know what's going on underneath the surface, that can cause confusion for others. Um, sometimes this is a temporary strategy, sometimes it's a more long-term strategy, depending on the situation. Mm -hmm. Accommodating would, would be where you um, accommodate the, the needs or the will of the other person. And so this would be useful in terms of creating goodwill between you and the other person um, and really building that relationship. If you know that pushing your view would damage the relationship, you might want to go towards accommodating more so. When situations are of limited long-term importance, if you know, okay, if I just accommodate this, then everything's gonna be fine in the long-term, that might be the best option. When you feel like you can't defend your position. Downsides are that your input might be ignored. So you might have something really good to say and, and if you're accommodating and giving into the other person, um, you might not get that out there. Um, you might not be able to achieve influence and you might feel undervalued. So this might bring up some feelings when you kind of give in your needs to someone else. Mm -hmm. Competing would be um, more so you would do this when the result is more important than sustaining the relationship. Um, and this is the one that's very um, confident and assertive, but not as accommodating to the other person. This might be useful when quick action is required in emergency situations where the short term is more important than the long term. Um, when you feel that you're the most qualified decision maker, and when you feel that reaching your goal is more important than what others think or when the, what, that it's more important than the relationship. Um, downsides are that others might feel ignored and may become resentful. So kind of you're on the opposite end of the accommodating person in this point of view. Um, others may never provide you feedback. They might feel intimidated or that their opinions aren't valued. And you might lose creative solutions because you're making that quick decision and you're um, kind of in control. So, um, like I said, this can be really useful when there's an emergency situation or quick action is needed. Yeah. Um, so this next one is compromising, but I'm just going to go back a few slides um, to show you where compromising is in this table. So we'll see that compromising is like right smack in the middle. It's cooperative, but not the most. And it's assertive, but not the most. So like it's in the middle. So that's kind of really the hallmark of compromising. I think a lot of us have compromised many times in our lives. So we know what this is like. And, you know, the example really is like, you can have like half a cheesecake or like, like half a chocolate cake, but not the whole thing, right? And kind of just like having to make do um, with like this half that you have, but it's not like the full thing that you wanted. And that's what usually happens in compromising. And it's not all bad though, because compromising can be really useful for issues that are time sensitive, that is of low importance. Like that's a deadline in two days and none of us can agree on what to do. Let's just compromise. Let's just get this project done um, when temporary solutions are needed. So we need to maybe finish this now, like meet this deadline, care for this person, like just kind of cross the finish line. And then maybe we can regroup if it's appropriate or you know, if, if we are able to. And this can happen when parties are equal. So earlier I was talking about the relational conflict. Sometimes you feel super confident, like competent, and sometimes you're like, no, I don't know what I'm talking about. So compromising can happen when both parties are on equal um, playing ground. So either they're as um, competent as each other, or maybe they're both lacking the same, like you know, knowledge and skill. And so in this um, situation, both parties have probably tried many different solutions and they failed. And the only compromise now is to give in and cave in a little bit in order to achieve um, the best outcome for everybody. And compromising, like I said, can come with downsides. Like we've all probably compromised in our lives and felt kind of like, like kind of ick, you know, like you may feel a bit dissatisfied. Maybe everyone feels dissatisfied or a large group feels dissatisfied because sometimes in compromising, not all our needs get met or not all the goals are achieved, right? Um, real is issues are not addressed. Um, compromising can maybe kind of work on like solutions are, so like real issues are not addressed and solutions maybe shortly kind of go together. 
you might address things that are like happening right now, but underlying maybe systemic flaws or team like relationship issues don't get addressed because there's just no time maybe. And, you know, with compromising, creative, collaborative like options may never be found because like, again, we're not able to, because of maybe time constraints or no one has new ideas, we're not able to collaborate on like new ways of doing things that maybe has not been done before, which kind of brings us into the last one, which is collaborating. So, um, I mean, it, it sounds like collaborating is like the gold standard way of, you know, um, being in a team and it's useful for really creative long-term solutions, right? If you have time um, to create a positive environment to sustain relationship. And this is because in collaborating, it kind of marries the two like epistemic conflict and like relational conflict thing, like both types, it marries all of it together. Because when we're collaborating, the team can now like keep in mind the task at hand, the goals that the team needs to meet, and everyone's individual needs, right? And because of that, like one of the downsides of that is that it can be very time consuming. And so this is also important when the issue is too important to permit compromise. Like doing this could be like disastrous or like really, really affect team morale. You really wanna collaborate or people might take this approach. Sometimes collaborating is useful when you're taking on a project that maybe you've never done before and you're like, okay, like we don't have a blueprint for this. We don't have a foundation on how to work with this. Collaboration can be really, really useful. But at the same time, it can be very frustrating. Um, I don't know, maybe that's a deadline in two days and now we're all trying to collaborate to find the best way that we're gonna do this. It's very time consuming. It can be very frustrating as well. But the, but the upside of it is that the team cohesion improves and like people feel safer in their team because their voices and their needs are heard. So then let's look at the consequences of unmanaged conflict in healthcare. Um, I, I looked up you know, studies on healthcare because I thought it was most relevant. I even included cute pictures. That little matchstick is burned out. You know, it's talking about higher burnout rates. So, um, these two studies, they did meta-analysis and they found that when conflict is unmanaged in healthcare, either between um, the healthcare worker and patients, between healthcare workers or healthcare workers and their managers, right? There are higher burnout rates because people don't feel heard. People don't feel valued. Like Alessia talked about earlier, people don't feel appreciated. So team morale goes down. And I think going to work every day where you feel like everyone's kind of like distance or kind of conflictual with each other, you're gonna start feeling lots of burnout because there is gonna be this lack of like safety that happens within the team. Reduce staff morale. People don't feel like they're like they're being valued, right? They show up to work, they don't know if people want them there. Um, that can be really damaging for their self-esteem. Um, reduce quality of patient care. This was something that I think came up pretty much um, came up a lot um, when I was reading. In healthcare, when there is lots of conflict or systemic issues that are not managed, patient care suffers because people are not able to agree on the best way to manage things, the best way to go about things. Um, and patients tend to uh, deal with the consequences of that. There's also lots of reported like low job satisfaction, people wanting to leave their jobs or feeling like this job isn't good enough, lots of dread and anxiety about going to work. Um, yeah, I was talking about reduced sense of psychological safety. And the thing is when there is unmanaged conflict, I think unless I was talking about this earlier, when we keep compromising or when we keep accommodating and just like giving in or avoiding, what happens is that the team doesn't actually learn how to deal with conflict in an effective way. And you know, when a conflict isn't really addressed, it keeps showing up again and again. I think this happens in like individual relationships too, right? Um, so when we don't like address or regulate conflict, well, it, it shows up again and again and that team, and as it shows up again and again, the team starts to feel more burnt out, more dissatisfied, um, and less safe in their team. So can learning about conflict management help, right? Like um, what can we do about it? 
So um, these two studies, they actually looked at um, nursing students. What they did was in this nursing, in these two nursing programs, they provided um, conflict resolution training, kind of like what we're doing right now, but theirs was much longer and more comprehensive. And so in this conflict um, resolution training, they re the skills that they thought or looked at was the ability to understand the other person that you're in conflict with. And unless I talked about this earlier, when we are able to kind of step into someone else's shoes or understand where the other person is coming from, resolving conflict is much easier. They looked at listening skills. Are people able to listen? Are they able to actively listen? Um, are people able to focus on the needs of the other person and the needs of themselves. So not accommodating and not competing, but really like how can we meet both our needs, um, adaptive skills and anger management skills. So they did a pre-test, post-test. So there was a control group and an experimental group in both these studies. The first one was done in Turkey. They had 105 nursing students. They did a pre-test. So they did this question on conflict resolution, their understanding and all of that before the training and after the training. And after the training, they found that people reported better ability to focus on other people and themselves, better ability to listen, um, better, better ability to really kind of um, empathize with the other person, which improved their conflict resolution skills. Similarly, with this other study that was done in 2021 by Torin and An, they did this in South Korea, 48 senior nursing students, pre-test and post-test as well. That was also a control group in this study. They did training on communication, problem solving and conflict resolution. Right, and they found that pre-test and post-test scores in the post-test, so after the training, people scored way higher in problem solving and they scored way higher in conflict resolution, which, you know, I think is sort of a testament to like learning about this can help us understand like, oh, there are skills out there for us to manage, really understand the mechanisms that go behind conflict management and how we can manage it better. Um, so this is just my little spiel of why conflict management learning can be very helpful or training can be helpful. And so um, we're gonna go into the next slide here and Alessia is gonna like bring us through the barriers that can happen, I think. Kind of like, mm -hmm. Yeah, with any um, kind of skill or strategy comes some barriers. So I think it's important to be aware of some of the barriers. And um, I think that can also help recognize that maybe it's not your skills, but more so the kind of situational nature of, of these, these kinds of things. So um, let's say that um, there's a perception that a conflict is a zero sum game. Nothing's gonna come out of it. Um, that can really cause a barrier. And if, if that comes from even one, one party mm -hmm. in, in the two, then um, I think that can really uh, create some difficulty getting through to them and being able to use the skills that you've learned. Yeah. Um, let's say that we're actually a victim, that the other person deserves the blame. There's no compromise that can be had here. Um, then, I mean, maybe conflict resolution isn't the way to go. Mm -hmm. um, a need for closure that would be threatened by considering information that contradicts our beliefs. Mm -hmm. Uh, let's say there's some confirmation bias. So um, confirmation bias would be you you um, already think the person is wrong. And so what's going to happen, or you think the person dislikes you, you're going to start to see all of the evidence that points towards the person being wrong or the person disliking you, further kind of polarizing you to the other side. And the other person might be doing that too. Mm -hmm. Uh, misinterpreting nonverbal communication. So let's say that you have a belief that the other person is against you or doesn't want to listen to you. You might be more likely to misinterpret some nonverbals as them not liking you because that's the belief that's already there. Our beliefs can really cloud how we perceive things. Um, and so if, if that were to happen, defenses can go up and that can really um, cause a barrier. Um, making misinformed assumptions about the other person. So again, this kind of goes along with confirmation bias and mm -hmm. seeing the other person as other or um, not really understanding their point of view and where it's coming from. Um, a lack of skills might cause barriers. And so that might mean that, you know, you might have to work on skills or um, 
or take some time to reflect on what went wrong. Uh, emotions, thoughts, and beliefs get in our way. And we forget our long-term goals and focus on short-term goals. And this can really happen when we're feeling emotionally heightened. Um, what ends up happening when we're emotionally heightened is the part of our brain that thinks about long-term planning shuts off. And the, the primary goal of the brain is to kind of seek safety. And so that can really um, get emotional and kind of the long-term goals get thrown out the window. Yeah. That's why it's important to take a step back at times. Yeah. So now... We're gonna go through. Yes. I mean, Alexia is gonna go through the communication techniques for conflict resolution. Just wanna show you the pretty slide we made. <laughs> so um, I think it's important to talk about states of mind. Um, so in any given situation, we might be in one of three states of mind. So one of them is called emotion mind. That's usually very mood dependent and emotion focused. So. It's the state of mind we're in when our feelings take over and we're making decisions based on our feelings. Uh, we really tend to disregard facts, reason, and logic in these moments. Um, even though sometimes it can feel like we're being really logical, uh, what's happening is our strong emotions have taken over. On the other side of the coin is uh, something called reasonable mind. That's where, when we're in a really logical state, when we're feeling very cool, rational, and focused and our um, decisions are guided by logic, facts, reason, and pragmatism. Um, in this kind of state of mind, we typically disregard emotions and values. So when we're in conflict, I think the ideal state of mind to be in is something called wise mind. It fuses emotion mind and reasonable mind and allows us to make decisions with all the parts of our brain. Um, and this kind of really taps into this wisdom that's within each of us and um, allows us to make decisions based on our values, our feelings, what we know is logical, our short-term needs and our long-term goals. It's kind of the most ideal state to be in. Yeah. Um, it's really, it's walking the middle path. Mm -hmm. So um, sometimes it can be hard to know if we're in this state of mind, especially during a conflictual situation because emotions can run high. And so um, what's important, I think, when especially if we know we're engaging in conflict, is to be able to take, take a step back, take a couple of deep breaths, uh, practice some of the mindfulness skills and the grounding that maybe you've learned in some of our other workshops or you've learned previously, just to really stay present and be able to engage all um, all of your skills and, and integrate your emotions and your logic. Next slide, right? Mm -hmm. Sorry. Okay. So um, some other factors to consider before engaging in conflict, um, are, are they capable of giving me what I want? Is this a like non-winning battle? Um, is this the appropriate kind of situation to be asking for this request or to be arguing here, especially if there's a difference in power that might, uh, it might make things difficult. Is this a good time to talk? So is it a good time to talk for me? Am I feeling in the right state of mind? Am I feeling rushed or am I feeling overly emotional? Um, or am I feeling calm and have the time? And is this a good time to talk for the other person? Do we know that they have a really busy meeting coming up or they've had a really hard day or they're overly emotional? Things might not go well in that case. Uh, do I know all the facts? Am I making assumptions? Am I going to come into this with um, kind of beliefs or biases? And is there a way to kind of get more facts before I go into the situation? Is what I want appropriate to the current relationship? So this kind of goes back to, are they capable of giving me what I want? And um, will I get what I want in this, in this, um, this conflict? And is the relationship reciprocal? Do they care about my needs? Are they concerned about giving me what I want or resolving this conflict? They might not be. And then that's an important factor to consider because that might not have anything to do with your conflict resolution skills. So um, this is the first kind of communication technique. Um, this comes from something called dialectical behavioral therapy. It's an acronym uh, called Dear Man. And it really is... Um, it outlines getting what you want or being able to say no to something. 
So the I'm gonna I'm gonna give you an example. So let's say that you have a coworker that continuously interrupts you during meetings. It's a repetitive pattern and it really, really bothers you. Um, and you want to let this coworker know that this is a problem and you'd like them to stop doing this. So getting what you want is them not doing this anymore. Okay. So the first thing you wanna do is describe the situation in a simple way, stating only the facts. This helps the other person understand the circumstances of the problem and your request. So in this situation, you might say, you've interrupted me three times this week when I'm sharing my thoughts during our lunch meeting. So that's just the first part. Mm -hmm. The next part is expressing your feelings using I statements. Um, this lets you take accountability for your own feelings, which prevents the other person from getting defensive. Uh, I think we've all had the experience when someone comes at us like, you always do this, and then suddenly we're angry and defensive. We don't want to do that. What we want to do instead is, when you interrupt me during our meetings, I feel undervalued, I feel frustrated, depends what you feel. Um, so again, this helps you take accountability for your part, which is your feelings, and letting them know how their actions are affecting you. Uh, next, you want to assert your needs by either saying no or asking for what you want in a clear way. So you have to ask for what you want because the person on the receiving end isn't a mind reader. They might not know what you're getting at. So you might want to say, I would like you to let me share fully in these meetings without interrupting me. And then reinforcing by letting the other person know how your request will benefit them too, because relationships are reciprocal. So this might look like, I believe I have some great ideas for our team, and I think we would benefit if I were able to share them. I would also be less grumpy at my desk and less short with our employees if I felt like my voice was being heard. Okay, so the second part of this acronym is MEN, and um, this focuses on more the manner in which you go about making these requests. So you wanna be mindful in the conversation kind of stay focused. Sometimes the other person can uh, distract us or get really stuck in the details, but you want to bring it back to the request and continue to assert yourself. Appearing confident, so make eye contact, keep your head up, stand straight and speak clearly. Um, with that confidence, it kind of asserts that you know what you want. And then uh, be willing to negotiate. So it might be that that person has thoughts and feelings about the situation and be willing to, to hear them out. Okay, that was Dear Man. Okay, so I'm gonna go through um, the speaker listener techniques and another skill and um, unless you will jump back in with more techniques. So for the speaker listener technique, right, we're going to look at the speaker skill and the listener. So what that means is if you are speaking and if you're listening, and we do both when we're in conflict. So I think one of the main important speaker skills or when you're speaking is to acknowledge the conflict, right? Um, acknowledging that there is a con conflict, the root of the conflict, the nature of the conflict can itself be very validating for the other person that you are seeing the same things that they are seeing, right? That, um, and Alessia said, like, describe it, just describe what's happening. That can be very validating because the person's like, oh yeah, like, I'm not crazy. Like someone else also sees this and they seem like they understand where I'm coming from. And it's very important here to separate the problem from the person. And I know in relational conflict, a lot of times we get like, yeah, they're doing this because they're like this, they're bad people. They're acting this because they want to, because they don't like me, but, it's much easier or more beneficial for us to separate the current problem from who that person is because this current situation is how they're acting in this present moment. We don't know what's going on for them. So separating it from them and coming from a place of like, this is the situation that I'm noticing, just describing it that way can be very disarming for someone because they, I think, can automatically sense also that you're not attributing blame to their personality or who they are. And as I was saying to this earlier too, using I statements, right? Like I feel upset when this happens as opposed to you make me feel upset, right? Because kind of taking responsibility for your feelings, I think can again, disarm someone because they're like, oh, this person's like 
expressing their negative emotions to me in a way that where they take responsibility for them as opposed to attributing it to like all my fault because that can be really difficult when someone's blaming you for their emotions or their state of mind or their well-being because it makes us feel incompetent as a person we're like oh my god I'm so incompetent or so I'm, I'm so bad that I'm making someone else feel so horrible and it makes us feel really defensive um, emphasize the current problems. And there's this term called kitchen sinking, right? Like sometimes when there's conflict, we're like, so this other time you did this and that other time you did that. And suddenly this like problem, which could have could have been like, yeah, you interrupt me a lot. Suddenly it's like, oh, all the five other times you hurt me as well. And that can be really overwhelming. And when that happens, we slip into um, emotion mind and now we're upset and we're no longer able to be in our wise minds and really like focus on the situation at hand. And it's also really important important to emphasize potential solutions and goals. And I mean, personally, like this, uh, these people and, and me, I also think like when we emphasize potential solutions and goals, I think it sends the message that we do want to resolve this conflict, that we're serious about resolving this conflict, that this is important to us to work on, right? And kind of focusing on like our shared goals can really unite us as opposed to divide, us, especially in conflict. So now on the flip side, like, what do you do as a listener, right? Someone's talking to you, you're listening, refrain from interrupting. <laughs> so yeah, like Alice's example was great because don't interrupt someone, right? When maybe someone speaks really slowly or they take time to process their thoughts because they're so nervous and they, they need to get it out, but they're not used to this. So we don't know why someone might be taking a long time. Maybe you're like, oh, I'm impatient. I want to, I want to get through this. Or maybe they say something, you're like, no, I have to correct it right now what happens then you're just getting into a back and forth of like disagreeing with each other but really refrain from interrupting let them finish let them get it out of their chest let them maybe they rehearsed it just let them get it out because when we don't interrupt we have this chance to actually listen and kind of get the whole like get all the facts right like do you have all the facts and so when we don't interrupt and listen we are more likely to get all the facts and I know we like unless I talk about like I don't like check to see maybe you're assuming someone else's nonverbal behavior sure but we can also check our own nonverbal behavior like and that could include like eye rolling like if someone was talking like I was talking to someone and they kept rolling their eyes at me I'm gonna get escalated right shrugging your shoulders like yeah whatever um looking away um yawning like just you know sighing making noises disagreeing kind of stuff People pick up on lots of nonverbal behavior and that can make them feel really anxious in this situation, which again, slips into emotion mind. Paraphrasing is very helpful, right? Just um, kind of repeating what someone else says, but in different words. And there's different um, levels here. So paraphrasing is like the first level where you just repeat what someone else says to them and that can make them feel heard, validated, and understood. The second level is reflection. Reflection is when we pick up on the underlying emotion in what someone is saying and we reflect it back to them. So if that person's like, you know, when you interrupt me, that's really difficult. So you'd say, when I interrupt you, like that makes you feel really bad. Like, you know, and so that person is now feeling like, holy, like, holy hell, this person totally understands me. They're seeing my point of view. Maybe they're even admitting to like, you know, causing the sort of anguish in me. And so the last level here is validation is saying like, look, paraphrasing, reflecting the emotion and validating like, yeah, being interrupted is really difficult. And sometimes it's hard, you know, to say like, I interrupted you and I made you feel bad. And you can keep it kind of neutral and being like being interrupted is really difficult. And sometimes when we talk to someone, um, they might bring up stuff that we don't agree with. Maybe in our culture or in our families, people interrupted each other all the time. Maybe you have executive dysfunction and you can't really like wait for someone to finish their sentence, but you don't necessarily have to be like, yeah, I did you wrong. Just the pure validation of like being interrupted can be hurtful, can be good enough, right? You don't have to agree with them, but you can validate their experience of pain or shame or guilt or negative emotions that they might be feeling. And don't be afraid to clarify, right? Ask clarifying questions. Don't be afraid, like, don't ask questions while they're talking, but after ask questions, like, can you tell me more about how you felt? Um, you know, what can I do better? Clarifying with them the situation, again, helps you get all the facts and it also helps someone else feel really understood. And so the last, uh, no, this last acronym tag skill is SOLVES, I know. And I put this like Rubik's Cube, cause like, you know, I 
I can't solve a Rubik's cube. Maybe one day I will, but so solves this Rubik's cube is complicated. We're trying to solve this complicated conflict issue. So the first thing is again, specifying the problem, right? We don't know what we're working with and we don't know what the problem is. I think it'd be useful for both parties to really specify the problem on both ends. Like what is one person experiencing? What's the other person experiencing? And what's a shared experience of this conflict? Outlining the goals. And I, as I said this earlier, but outlining the goals of the situation can help us. Like when we have goals, we know the steps we need to take in order to reach those goals. So we're not just grabbing at thin air, like we got to solve this conflict, but how? Like, what are the goals? And in terms of figuring out goals, like you can ask yourself these questions. At the, after this conflict is resolved, what would I want? After this conflict is resolved, what, how would my situation change? After this conflict is resolved, how would I feel? Like things like that. So imagine the conflict resolved, how would you feel, behave, how would things be? Is kind of your goal. It lets you know what you want out of the situation. List all possible solutions, even silly ones. Just list all of them together and look at the look at the solutions. What could go wrong? I know this sounds like a simple pros and cons list, but um, sometimes we don't do it in conflict, you know? So look at all the consequences and pick the solution that both of you think shows the most promise. Establish, implement a plan, and survey the outcome. Because a lot of times I think when we resolve conflict, we don't really check back in like, hey, this was our plan, we've executed it. Like, how are you feeling? Were your needs met? Or you can ask yourself, were my needs met? And so surveying the outcome helps us take away stuff from the conflict. We learn new skills, we, new, we learn new ways of being, new ideas to things. So surveying the outcome is really a nice closure to this whole like solve skill. And yeah, I'm done. So Alessia is gonna talk about presentation. Mm. One one thing I wanted to touch on before I get into this slide is mm -hmm. um, validation. And so sometimes um, it's really hard to understand why a person did what they did. Mm -hmm. um, but I think we can always validate the emotion. Someone's emotion is is theirs, and and um, we can always try to understand how they're feeling and. Um, allowing them to share how they're feeling. And this automatically can bring a person down. When you say like, I understand that you feel, felt frustrated when I interrupted you. Um, maybe you don't understand that they then yelled at you about it, but the frustration I think can be understood. So validate the emotion and not always the action. Um, so some other techniques, um, try to find common ground and this can be done through good communication. So um, all of the techniques that were just provided um, through that, I think that almost always you can find some common ground or interest in resolving the solution. Um, I think that especially at work and you're working in a similar field, some of your interests are probably similar. Um, for example, helping other people. And so that can even just be the underlying interest there. Um, when you find that common ground, this can really help prevent personal attacks that can further aggravate the situation. And then um, if there's some common ground, everyone will at least feel that there's one perspective that's valid. Mm -hmm. uh, keeping it thoughtful. So um, really avoid blaming, um, being accusatory. Um, definitely don't insult or make disparaging comments or behave dismissively, like Bill was saying, like not looking away or rolling eyes. Um, this can just heighten the situation and take us away from resolving conflict. Um, so trying to be really thoughtful in what you say and being careful what comes out. Um, and then knowing your limits. So um, sometimes the best thing to do in a conflict, especially if it gets really heated, is calling a timeout. Um, because if you're both heated, you're not thinking rationally, you're not in your wise mind anymore, and it's not really going to get anywhere. You might get stuck in circles fighting about the same thing. So the best thing to do is call a timeout and um, either agreeing to disagree for the moment or setting a time where you're going to discuss it again. Um, and it's important to set that time too, because that shows a commitment to wanting to resolve the problem. Um, and that's, I think, all that we have. So yeah. we'll leave it open for the next few minutes for questions and comments. Feel free to write them in the chat. Um, 
And should we send the, the link again for the survey in case anyone missed it? Yeah. Have um, that here, let me yeah. see. I'm, I'm just gonna have to go back all the way to the first okay. second slide. <laughs> okay. Yeah. But in hindsight, next time I'll do it two times. That <laughs> Let me see if I can copy it into the chat as well. Oh, yes. Anyone okay. who just wants to click on Thanks. it. Unless. No problem. Okay. Yeah, Let's if you there. have questions, put them in the chat and link and QR code is available. Yes, we do have references. Um, Phil, if you would like to. Yeah, okay. Um, Thank you, Katie. Yeah, okay. Give me a moment. Mm -hmm. Okay, here you go. These are the references. Let me take a picture. <laughs> 